Hey everyone, welcome to the first video of section 7.6. In this section, we are taking a look at complex eigenvalues, which can also happen in this case, because we, when we try to find eigenvalues, we get a quadratic equation. And there is a decent chance that that equation may have complex eigenvalues. So we're going to start looking at what happens in that case, what we can do to try to make that, to make it work, to get real solutions out of this at the end. It's going to look fairly similar to what we did in um, chapter 3 for second order equations, but there's going to be a little twist to it. And so we'll take a look at that mainly in this video and what we have to do to make things work out in this case when it's a little bit trickier. Let's go ahead and just jump right into it. So in the case of complex eigenvalues, the idea is pretty much the same as we had for chapter 3. The idea there is we use the fact that if I have e to the lambda plus i mu, I can write this as e to the lambda times cosine of mu plus i sine of mu and use that to get me a real and imaginary parts to my solution and put them together to get an actual solution. So I can find a complex valued solution. I can then split to the real and imaginary parts and take those two as my two independent solutions and then use that to give me a general solution. The idea here is the same. However, something a little tricky happens. And that's because to do these problems, we need both eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So it turns out that complex eigenvalues generally give rise to complex eigenvectors as well. The only thing that's really makes difficult is that the splitting into real and imagined parts isn't quite as simple as it was in the normal function case. So this makes splitting into real and imaginary parts a little more complicated, but the end result is the same. That is, once I get this split into real and imaginary parts, then my general solution is of the form c1 times the one that's real plus c2 times the one that's complex. I have to get there first, but once I get there, that, that will give me my general solution. So, so let me now just do an example of splitting something into its real and imaginary parts to show you what that's going to look like in this case. And then I'll talk more about where we get this general solution sort of stuff from there anyway. So let's say I do my eigenval eigenvector stuff and I end up with this result. I end up seeing this in my answer. 1 plus i vector 1 plus i 1 times e to the 2 plus i t. Now to get my final answer I need to split this into its real and imaginary parts. So how can I do that? Well let's just start by writing out the e in terms of what it is. So this is the vector 1 plus i 1 times e to the 2 t times cosine of t plus i sine of t. And that just comes from splitting e into the cosine plus i sine part that we've done a couple, we've done several times already. Now what I want to do is I want to now pull, move some things around a little bit. So I'm going to move the e to the 2 t to the front because I can. And then 1 plus i 1 cosine t plus i sine t. And now what I'm going to do is I want to multiply this cosine plus i sine inside the vector. So I get e to the 2t, 1 plus i cosine t plus i sine t, times 1 cosine t plus i sine t. And now the first term on the top of the vector, I have to FOIL that out. So I get e to the 2t times cosine t plus i cosine t plus i sine t minus sine t, where the minus came from an i squared that was sitting in there, because i squared is minus 1. At the bottom, I get cosine t plus i sine t. And now I can take this and split it into its real and imaginary parts. So I can write this as e to the 2t times cosine t minus sine t cosine t plus i times cosine t plus sine t sine t, right? Vectors, when you add them, you add them component-wise. So I can just split up the two parts and put them in two separate vectors and get a real vector and an imaginary vector. So then uh, I want to split this into real imaginary parts. So what I get out of this, I will get my two solutions from this right here. So the two solutions I get are u of t equals e to the 2t times cosine t minus sine t cosine t and v of t equals e to the 2t 
cosine t plus sine t sine t. And then my general solution is x of t equals c1 u of t plus c2 v of t. Where the u and the v are the ones right above there. So now the book uses a slightly different formulation to actually write out what these look like. They have like 1, 0 cosine t, 1, 1 cosine t plus negative 1, 0 sine t. It work, it's the same thing if you put it all back together. Either form is okay and totally acceptable to write. So that's the sort of process that you need to do to split something into real imaginary parts in this case. It's a little more tricky, it's a little more involved, but it still works in more or less the same way. You may have to FOIA some stuff out or cancel things out and work it out, but it comes together the same way and you get your two solutions out of that that I'm giving you this here. And again, when we get to doing this for actual eigenvalues and eigenvalues solving for the actual roots, you only need to pick one of the two roots to actually do your problem. Right? Just like in the second order case, when I had like 1 plus or minus i as my two roots, I only had to pick one of them because I could get both the sine and the cosine from that, and I didn't have to use the other one. The same thing happens here. You only need to pick one of the roots, probably the plus one's the easier one to do, because you get the same u and v from the negative one as well. So when you're actually solving problems, you only need to pick one of the conjugate roots because you get the same u and v out of the other one either. maybe one has a minus sign but it doesn't help doesn't change anything all right so that's it for this one um, i'm going to give you a problem to work on which is going to be just doing this same process again on a different set of numbers um so take well, i'll show you that put that up for you right now take a look at it and put that on the worksheet all right so there's that problem just split that guy into real imaginary parts and put that on the worksheet so in the next video, we're going to go into these face portraits for these kind of graphs. They're not quite straight lines anymore, but we can still get a decent idea of what's going on for them. So we'll take a look at that, and then we'll do some examples of solving general solutions and stuff in the video after that. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.